Welcome to the third podcast covering Objective 3, and in this objective, we're going to focus on landscape and regional conservation ideas to um, help uh, sustain biodiversity. Typically, when we think about conservation, we think about saving the, the individual species, and this is important. However, if you take this one step beyond just the species, we recognize that if we can help conserve the entire community, the ecosystems, and the landscape where they live, that this does, has a greater effect on helping preserve, conserve the species. And so we have to understand the entire ecosystem in order to make these kinds of efforts. For instance, let's start with this term called an edge. An edge can be defined as the boundary between ecosystems. A really good picture of this is seen in figure 5617 on page 1266. This is a picture of Yellowstone National Park. This could be anywhere, but it just so happens to be in Yellowstone. And what we see here is a river or stream going through the park. And then we see forested areas on either side of the stream. So we have the ecosystem associated with the river, so the, the aquatic ecosystem here. And then we have the ecosystem associated with the forest areas here. And the edge exists in between these two ecosystems. So this is our edge. The edge is different from these two extremes here. It has its own set of chemical and physical properties that make it unique from these two separate ecosystems. And because of that, animals or other organisms, plants and animals, that live in these edge can take advantage of the nutrients found and the, the, the other benefits found in these two ecosystems and their survival adaptations. So the differences in physical properties we could think of as there could be a difference in temperature, right? Wind, could even be pH, the soil, the pH in the soil could be different, moisture, and many other kinds of physical parameters that are going to be different in this edge community, edge ecosystem, I should say. We can see lots of biodiversity. So we'll draw an up arrow biodiversity. in these edge communities and, and mainly because these are naturally occurring edges. However, if we were to create, let's say we're going to make a highway through this forest. So now we're going to destroy part of this forest and we're going to make this big highway through here. So we can get to the lake, to the river. We have created now some edge communities here and here in between um, the forested areas in between these two separate forest ecosystems here. In this case, when we create them ourselves like this, biodiversity goes down in the edge communities. In addition, biodiversity within these ecosystems here also goes down. We could have made this um, human-made structure by building a dam here that would have had the same effect but we're going to talk about this road here so we prevented these two populations um, from interacting with each other because it doesn't take long for members of this community to realize that it's very dangerous to cross this road and those that do often don't make it so we've really limited the interaction between these two forest ecosystems we recognize that this is a bad thing because we know that a uh, decreased biodiversity is not good and we want to do everything we can to increase biodiversity. One thing that we have done to increase this prob probability of these two uh, populations from to increase the probability that they will mingle with each other, we have created what we call movement corridors. Something that goes over the highway so that animals 
can go across it safely. And this allows for that needed um, interactions between these populations to once again increase biodiversity. And we call these movement corridors. And so let's write that somewhere here. The next thing we want to talk about are biodiversity hotspots. Biodiversity hotspots are typically small areas. They have a high number of what we call endemic species. Endemic species are species found in that area, but nowhere else on, on the earth. And we'll also find a high number of endangered or threatened species. Figure 5621, I'm sorry, 5620, figure 5620, shows a nice map of where these hotspots are. And if you look at this map, what you'll notice is they're found primarily in warmer areas, not exclusively, but primarily in warmer areas and along coasts. So we see them all along Central America. We see them on the western part of the United States, all along the western coast of South America, all the way to um, most of Chile is not, not included. And then we see some on the other side of South America. Along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, we see them, Madagascar, and along some of the coasts of Africa, as well as Asia. So these are warmer environments and typically coastal environments, but they make up a very small percentage of the Earth. These hotspots are less than or approximately one and a half percent of Earth's total land. So it's not a, a large part of Earth. Often, nature reserves are built in these hotspots. Often, nature reserves are built in these hotspots. The only problem with this is, is sometimes it's hard to identify what is truly a, a really good hotspot for biodiversity. It may be a really uh, hot spot for bird species, but not for butterfly species. Um, Sometimes there's a tendency to favor vertebrates or some other kinds of species in these hotspots and ignore the other ones. And so we might be missing some really important um, biodiversity hotspots for organisms that receive less attention but are equally important. However, they still make good places, um, these biodiversity hotspots, they still make good places to make these nature reserves because in these nature reserves, we're able to protect these species from hunting, we're able to monitor them and see how they're growing and how they're um, rebounding as a species. And since these biodiversity hotspots is where we see a lot of endangered and threatened species, as well as endemic species, they make logical sense. The last thing we want to talk about in this podcast is urban ecology. And as the name implies, urban ecology is the study of organisms in an urban setting, so within a city. With more and more people living in, in cities and cities expanding quickly, it's really important to understand how organisms, including humans, live within these cities and, and to examine things like the quality of water, the quality of other nutrients available to all the organisms that live within a city environment. Your book cites that this is the first time in history where more than half of the people on Earth actually live in cities. And that there will be, by 2030, which really isn't that far off, there will be 5 billion people on Earth that actually live in a city. And so understanding the ecology of these cities um, will become increasingly important. Okay, that's all we have for this podcast. If you have any questions, please let me know, and we'll talk to you later. Bye.